Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that you won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and BB King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. It still is. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. <sighs> it's, it's, um, yeah, it's still a good one. It sure it's is. It's still a good one. We got a little, um, we got a little uh, uh, high energy player. Yes, with that's going to be with us today. Uh, before we get to him, though, we got to do our thank yous. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, that's right. Follow, follow, follow. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Facebook, like us on Facebook. Yes. I don't yes. know. Anybody like you, us. You can't follow us on like Facebook you, and like us on Twitter. You can't something. hate us on Facebook, but you right. can like us. Yeah. There's no hate button yet. There's no hate <laughs> button. You know. And uh, please uh, go to iTunes rate us just rate us five stars give us five we'll love yes, you yes yeah. and and i think you can still if you haven't already get the youtube album or, or cd or release or whatever they call it it's not a damn album anymore except i i would like mine on vinyl but you can still get it for free you know <laughs> i think it's i think it's until the end of uh end of september or, or maybe it's yeah. into october sometime yeah. but they're 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 giving away for a long time so ne just a little side note real quick never mm -hmm. was a fan of YouTube, a uh, YouTube. I was never a fan. You know, I was a metalhead, right? Mm -hmm. Who's gonna like the Edge? You know, I went and saw U2 at IMAX theater. I love the band. Oh, really? I, I was blown away because it was a live performance in in yeah. like some soccer field uh, in Brazil. There was like nine. Nine trillion people. Yeah, they make stadiums larger there. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I became a fan. Awesome. Yeah, don't like it all, but mm -hmm. for what I, you know, when I see that, when I hear the songs that they played in that, I kind of envision that thing, and it, it brings me back to it. And see, you know, like we were talking about the last time of, you know, recognizable guitar players. He also. <laughs> did something different that <laughs> nobody else had done before. It's like it was just you know he had he had the the, the timing of the delays as as part as a very integral part of the oh, yeah. a lot of the songs you know yeah. and th that I mean the edge had yeah. his own thing going on as well. It might you know? get loud. Great oh, yeah. movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. To see how he did that, he plays his old demos. Yeah, in there, so you can really see. Um, he still has some of his old cassettes laying around. Yes. He was just doing demo stuff, and that's so cool. Do you need a wall of effects? Well, no, but he does, he and, does. and it works. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> And he's it's got, literally a wall. It, oh, it is. It is. <laughs> and, and a lot of those are just used for one song, or maybe even one part yeah. of one song. He'll punch it because in, punch it Because he so faithfully recreates yes. what he does live. Yeah, he's got a lot going on. Oh yeah, he's not a solo master, but man, that dude is doing a ton of work. Oh yeah, no, it, yeah, it, you know, there's it's it's for all practical intents and purposes a three piece band, and it just sounds big because of you him. know of yeah, and and well, not taking away from the rhythm section, no, but, no, 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 but you know, it, it things are structured, yeah, like the record, you know, when you hear mm -hmm. it live, and. That those records are are pretty, you know. Yeah. There's there's a lot going on there, you and know? there's mainly sophisticated when it comes to production. Absolutely, yeah. and mainly played and explore. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. In um, those early days, he was big on the explore and uh, and AC thirty and AC thirty metal you know? guitar doing all that jingle jangly. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, isn't that wild? That is. Yeah, because in that movie, in that well, in the Brazil thing, they show some back behind the scenes stuff, but they also uh, in that in that might get loud that you see him and he's playing that. Uh, he picks it up and he shows you the guitar mm-hmm. that you know. I'm yeah, like, that, that's a great movie. Yeah, that's a great movie. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. I, 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 well, sorry. I don't know. I was just I was um, I, I was perusing through a guitar aficionado the other day you amazing know. magazine it's, it's, like a, it's a gq a, of guitar it is <laughs> i mean it's it's you know it has guitar in the title yeah but it's it's kind of it's more of a lifestyle <laughs> magazine than it is just a guitar magazine yeah, you'll you know? see an ad for an eighty thousand dollar wristwatch <laughs> oh yeah i've i've actually seen more than that but yeah, it's yeah. it's it you know it's a lifestyle granted that most people you know can only aspire to <laughs> if if you dare yeah. uh but it's 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 very cool because it's not just about guitars um no you know you but like you'll see people in there and you'll learn something about them that doesn't come up in a guitar magazine like mm-hmm. you know uh, like and because you you just mentioned the watch, you know you'll you'll read an article on Elliot Easton, but it won't necessarily be about his guitars. It will be about his um, affinity for watches. <laughs> you know, yeah, which is kind of cool because that's a side that you would probably never know. Yeah, no, I mean he he's really into very cool watches. You know, mm-hmm. and that's you know, th- I, I that's cool. It's like he, he's he's eclectic. Mm-hmm. In in a different aspect than just music, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, again, another another guy who had his own style in the music. I mean, th- they used to call him Slick Licks Elliot. Yeah, you know? we were talking because, about this last week, right? Yeah, yeah. it's it's just um, you get in, say what you got to say, get out, and that's that's that it had to fall within that format, you know, because the cars weren't like oh, uh, no, a they, jam band. It no. was like it was it was a very pop thing. Yeah. You know, but there were guitar solos in it, you know, but he would get in, make a really nice statement and get out, you know, and that's what I really loved about him. I got to see him live on David Letterman. Oh, yeah? Yeah, him and Rick Ocasek came out and they did something. This was years ago, uh, but we were right there, fourth row. Oh, wow. And he came out. um, One, the coldest thing I've ever been to in my life the studio uh they keep it you could you could hang meat <laughs> yeah from that studio yeah number two um that band is loud as hell i mean you can't even think i mean it is loud <laughs> and they wheel those guys out he came out and left-handed player mm-hmm. and just just kicks it man yeah i, I mean, mean he's that, a very good player that, that cat can play well he um he was. He's been playing for a long time now with um, Cle- Creedence Clearwater Revisited. <laughs> he he took uh, John Fogarty's place. Really? Yeah, he's actually doing the Creedence stuff too. Wow. Yeah, he plays in Creedence Clearwater he's one, Revisited. He's one of those very underlying unsung kind of hero guitar players. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, he's I, a really strong player, and you know, yeah. he may not be flashy, but he's a really strong player. You know. Yeah, I'd love to hear like a solo album from him where he just goes off mm-hmm. you know because i'm ma- i mean some of his licks like you said he's in and out but some of his stuff it's like whoa what did he just do there yeah you yeah, know he's, he's, he's an underrated player absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah you know uh, so uh, you know again looking through there you know you've ron wood <laughs> is an accomplished painter uh. you know and he was the uh, Painting, he's been painting as long as he's been playing guitar. You really, know? So, you know, it's it's a it's a cool thing to to breeze through. And then, um, you know, I don't know if anybody's into chefs. I mean, there's there's so many, you know, cooking shows on on TV now. Well, but, we need you know. that as a fat ass nation. <laughs> we need more cooking shows. But uh, you know, <laughs> I'm no, sorry, uh, I just Alton Brown, the 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 celebrity chef that does. Um, uh, oh God, what show did does he do? Chopped. I forgot. He, he's. I mean, he's, he's had a few shows on, uh, and I can't remember. Uh, probably on the Food Network or something. I never. He's. A, Sorry. He's a guitarist too. Get out of town. Yeah, it's. Like, you know, you you find out all these cool things about people. Well, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, cake guy. Mm. Cake Duff. Guy. Duff. Oh, Duff Goldman. He's yeah. a bass player. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, we've played together. <laughs> yeah, like, That's crazy. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, you find musicians everywhere. I mean, absolutely. You know, absolutely. especially the string guys. And we got a, we got a, you know, Duff's from the, the Baltimore area. You know, and he's, yeah. he's he lives in on the left coast now. He's just so busy with with stuff. I don't even get a chance to see him anymore. We've got a, actually another guy coming out of out of Baltimore, um, who is breaking. He's he's kind of like following uh, Duff's progression out of here. Uh, his name's Rodney Henry, and he's known as the Pie Guy. He was actually on. I love pie. Oh, oh my God! He's got savory. St- oh man, it's really. Oh yeah, but he's uh, not a cake guy. I'm a pie a guy. Pie guy. That's okay. Yeah, we we put together an Elvis thing that we did uh, like Night of a Hundred Elvises for a few years when when they they were still in town and weren't all over the country. Yeah. Um, but he's he's a he's a guitar player. He's kind of more of a rockabilly dude, but he's really good. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so he makes it, pies, and he makes pies, and he's opening pie shops all over the place now. I say we got to talk to this guy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, Rodney's cool. Rodney's a character. I there. actually had pie for my birthday. Did you? Well, I, I, I'm not a cake guy. Right. All these years, and I said I keep. I, sorry, but it, I just said to my wife, I said I, I don't want a cake, and she was like, "Come on," and I'm like, "I don't want a cake." <laughs> So she goes, well, what do you want? I said, well, I want a pie. She's like, are you serious? And I said, that's yeah. That's awesome. So I got a pie. Of course, apple. Okay. Because that's how it works. Right. And uh, did the a la mode. So you can't do cake a la mode. It's, it's, well, you can put ice cream yeah. on it, but it's yeah. pie. You, t- you got the hot with the cold. Oh. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's so my weakness right there. I just. So I will. Uh... <laughs> I will uh, next birthday. I will get you a dangerously delicious pie because that's what Ron these companies, these pie shops are called. Yeah, danger, and they are dangerously delicious. And then they're, I'll go they're, into they're, my diabetic coma, and we'll call yes, it a you night. Will. Yes, you <laughs> will, unless you want a savory one. You know, I get you like a dinner pie. You know, it's, that's crazy, man. Yeah, he's you know, so he's he's uh, <laughs> he's becoming a, he's becoming another um, Baltimore icon. You know, yeah. And uh, oh, speaking of icons, we we we, we got to bring in our guest who's. An icon in his own right, yes. but um, they they're having uh, the first annual uh, Maryland Music Awards uh, later this year. Yeah, in town, and uh, it's it's becoming quite a thing, and it's uh, uh, it's you know it's got some nice sponsors and backers behind it. It's you know mm-hmm. Vance over at Sheffield Audio, who I mean Sheffield's been around forever. They they had one of the first mobile recording trucks. Yes. You know they gorgeous facility by the way. Yeah, I mean there are some notable live albums that, that come out of those. They have facilities. an SSL board there. They do. Yes, they, do. they do. I've seen uh, it. But, but they're putting together this Maryland Music Awards and um they they had the the finalists announced the other day and uh it, you know I got it's funny. I got two dogs in this fight because they're, they're two of the nominees for Maryland Icon uh-huh. were uh, Crack the Sky. Of course. Who Palumbo I play with in, in Johnny Chill. Mm-hmm. And a really good friend of mine, Rob Fahey, who used to be with this little band called The Ravens. Yes. Who did? And if anybody's familiar with Fast Times at Ridgemont High, of course, uh, raised on the radio is is Rob's song yep. and you know, done by the Ravens. So uh, they're both up for for Baltimore Icon, and you know they're still around and kicking it hard. Man. That's cool. Congratulations to those guys, man. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my, props to them. Props to yes. my buds, man. So, um, so you know, we'll uh, that that brings us to our guest, and he. Um, I don't know if. if if you remember this band from back in the day, I certainly do. I do. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, they were... Uh, I had to go I, back in the archives just a little bit, but then I was like, I do remember. I, w- I would say they're probably their closest competition in during the day in their genre. They, they were, you know, neck and neck with uh, Living Color. Yeah, you know? Living Color, uh, you know, I, these guys are much more of a metal band. I would say. Okay, okay. You know, Living Color, because of Vernon Reed's background, they were heavy. They were they were definitely metal, but when he did a solo, it was like, well, we're going off into another land. <laughs> 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 Vernon yeah, some, Reed some played of those... some of the craziest things ever. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, are you making it up, or what is going on here? But well, he that's was, the most fun with just well, making Well, it he up. was a fusion guy, you right. know, before that, and that's why so, his well, solos. Well, that, that was their guitar player, and... Yes. and this band, Twenty Four Seven Spies, yeah, man, had their own powerhouse of a guitar player um, in a man named Jibby Hazel, 
and uh, I met Jimmy a few years ago, and uh, we uh, we became friends. And I just said, "Hey, man, we got the show. You want to be on?" And he's got some things going on, and yeah, we'll we'll see what's going on, and you know, we'll 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 see how back in the day is is different from now, maybe, or <laughs> or if it's exactly the same. Who knows, you know? But Jimmy's a great guy, yeah. and he's one hell of a guitar player. So uh, we will have with us Mr. Jimmy Hazel from Twenty Four Seven Spies momentarily. <laughs> I don't often listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to amps and axes. Be a rebel. Play guitar. As promised, we have the one and only Mr. Jimmy Hazel. Jimmy, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm good. How you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Excellent. How's uh, Excellent. My, uh, my co-host here, Mick? Mick, Jimmy? Hey, Jimmy. hey Mick. Yeah. How you doing? All right, man. How you doing? I'm hanging, man. It's a... It's a mellow day. I'm, I'm kind of digging it. So <laughs> good, good. Yeah, man. You, you don't get uh, too many mellow days. <laughs> well, I, you know, I would imagine you're kind of a busy guy at times. Not in 2014. <laughs> yeah, right, you, don't, you yeah. know, it's it's weird. It's kind of you, you know not the kind of busy that most people would think, but it, there's just always something going on. There's just always something going on. So it's it's nice for it to be mellow for the moment. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm sitting down. I'm speaking with you. It's quiet in the crib. Awesome. All is good, man. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad we caught you on a quiet moment. So, uh, <laughs> Me too. Let's, uh, let's hit the Wayback Machine a little bit first. Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> when we were young. That's right. That's right. When, um, yeah. when did you decide that you wanted to pick up that thing with six strings on it and make some noise? Oh. Man, early, early, early. I, I, in, in my house, I was exposed to music literally probably by the time I was two. Wow. I was, I was singing or attempting to sing. Actually, my parents had me on, there's a tape of me attempting to sing as a baby, which was just classic. <laughs> I was trying to sing uh, Love, uh, Love's a Hurting Thing by Lou Rawls. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. I've always been surrounded by music, so I just I loved music, and I had an older brother who was eight years older than me, so I was born in '63. So by the time I was, mm, wow, say about six, so around there, he's bringing in all of like the real good stuff. You know, he's mm. the one that introduced me to Cream and Hendrix and wow. Sly and all of that stuff. So I heard all of that stuff <laughs> as it came about, mm -hmm. which was deep because, you know, if you're, if you think about it, if you're born in 63, Sly's first album comes out in what, 67? Yeah. yeah. Are You Experience comes out in 67. 67. You know, at four years old, this is what I'm hearing. And I'm, I'm you know, and I'm just kind of like, they're not doing nursery rhymes. Um, <laughs> there's some really weird stuff coming through the speakers. You know what I mean? Just really freaked out stuff. But Hendrix was really kind of like the jump off for me. Same thing. So was West Montgomery for that matter because my parents played tons of West Montgomery in the house. And the real, the real like thing that cemented it was um, my brother took me across the bridge from where we lived um, to the New York Pop Festival where I actually met Jimi Hendrix shook his hand wow and you know i'm six i was just gonna point. say <laughs> oh my god six years old you know and it was kind of like kind of surreal because you, you know when you're six you don't even know what to say like hi mr hendrix <laughs> <laughs> that's sir. about it you know Hello, my parents sir. didn't know that he took me um to the festival because he was babysitting great brother he was awesome <laughs> but the cool thing that happened after that was i stopped asking my parents for a football and started asking for a guitar <laughs> that is just amazing that, I mean really to be able to have met the guy you know I'm a couple of years older and never had the opportunity to, yeah, to meet him you know, you know it, it was, I think that was really just pure wow I, I can't even I don't even want to call it luck it, it, there really is a, a little bit more of a story to that but the real reason why it kind of happened was Jimmy wound up I, I grew up on 138th Street and Willis Avenue in Mitchell Projects Mm -hmm. um, he knew somebody in the back of the projects and there was this limo out and all the kids, it's summertime and all the kids are like, oh wow, there's a limo you know, 
kids are always curious when a limo shows up. Sure, you know? sure. Especially when there's no hearse attached to it. <laughs> so it's kind of like, there's got to be some famous person or something. Right. But it turns out to be Hendrick, and he's, he's actually talking to all of these kids, all these teenagers, and my brother's one of them. And he's like, you know, asking them if they're coming to the concert. Wow. Really? It's is... right across the bridge, you know, it's at Randall's Island, you know, so that's how we wound up going to the concert. So, <laughs> really. You know, a personal invite from Jimmy. In a really strange, <laughs> twisted way, you know, because, you know, the one thing about Jimmy that I remember, and I wish I remembered more, was that he had a great affinity for, for, for teens and kids, period, because wow. he was always curious about what they thought. Because wow. he wasn't that much older than them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But since they were the ones buying the records, and, and they were the ones dictating, you know, the things that were hip at that point, because, you know, that, that, that wasn't our parents' music at that point. No, things had drastically was, <clears throat> changed at that yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. You know, so <clears throat> it, it, I, I, I guess he never took, he never missed an opportunity to ask, you know, teenagers or people of his age or a little bit younger what they thought or, or whatever so it just happened to be a real great as far as i'm concerned a blessing yeah. that that happened <laughs> um but yeah my parents didn't understand why i wanted a guitar so bad <laughs> and and the concert was july 17th 70 so i i literally was like leaving notes <laughs> like you know my birthday's coming my birthday's coming uh, <laughs> september 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 and i got the first guitar september 3rd for my for my seventh birthday. Wow. And then he passed two weeks and three days later. Yeah. Mm. And it really messed me up. I, I don't think, I don't think I knew, well, I, I figured it out years later, but it was called depression. But, because <laughs> I really wow. kind of thought, like I'd lost a family member. Well, somebody that was way. so influential, I mean, at such an early age, I mean, that leaves a big mark, man. Yeah. You it know? did. It really did. And so th the crazy thing that happens from him passing was I kind of really dove headfirst into trying to play and teaching myself to play. And th the best thing that happened in, his, in the wake of his passing was that there was a whole new crop of guitar player who really wanted... He affected so many people that there wasn't a guitar player probably for the next... 10 years in particular, black guitar players or Hispanic guitar players, there was a whole crop of, you know, Hendrix wannabes or people who were just affected by what he did. Mm -hmm. So I had a whole host of people to look to and, and to pick from and, and to study from. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and we were talking about it last time is that, you know, he was one of those game changers, man. Absolutely. Ooh, paradigm shifter to, yeah. to no end. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and it's really funny. I think the real crazy thing that most people really don't get with Jimmy is that if you remove the distortion, if you remove the antics, I mean, he's playing straight R&B. Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, that's where he came from. Yeah. That's where, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, but so many people kind of miss that point. And I'm like, you don't get it. I'm like, that dude was a rhythm player. Bar none. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, deadly hands, man. I'm like, from, from rhythm to solos and anything in between, everything in between. So this, this, this is a dude who literally changed the game by, by, by literally introducing what was already there, but pushing it to a, to a point that nobody had ever pushed it to before. And just completely reinventing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and you were mentioning take away the distortion and all and the antics. A, a lot of his, for me, a lot of the best stuff is clean. It's just it, yeah. because he was such a great rhythm player, it is just so beautiful. His, his voicings mm -hmm. are so beautiful, you know, and it doesn't take a shit ton of distortion on top mm -hmm. of that and jumping around on stage. It just, right. it's just, it's him and a guitar and a clean amp. I mean, he, he yeah. played a Fender Twin a lot in the, in the studio, yeah, you know? Yeah, man. And mm -hmm. God, it's just so beautiful. Well, you know, like uh, just a song that everybody knows, Little Wing. I was oh, just going yeah. to say, yeah. my favorite pop, and it's really funny because when you talk to people and they, and they get into like what their favorite period of Hendrix is, I go, you think about it. It's really funny because are you experienced? Acts as bold as love. 
Electric yeah. Ladyland. Mm-hmm. Those are like three chapters in somebody's diary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Be- oh, yeah. Because three. they were there's such wow. It's almost kind of like so much happened between each album that it affected each album. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, all your experience, it's kind of like the breakthrough, which is kind of like wow. Okay, I'm in a room that I can try new things out for the first time. So we get like third stone from the sun. Nobody ever done anything like that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, it it's still rooted in a real strange way. Fire is just straight. That, fire could have been R and B chart hit number five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Easily. So, but by the time you get to Axis, I mean, I can only imagine what the year. Well, Axis came out actually the same year that our you experienced it in Europe. Not in America. Huh. They both came out, I think, the same year. But in America, it became 67 and 68. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, I think they both got released. Um, Axis came out later that same year. Um, the record- So much had happened. Yeah, the recording yeah. on Axis is just amazing because the amazing. sound quality yeah. is like, it's like night and day yeah. to the other albums. And I always think about all the time when I read Chaz Chandler saying that Jimmy had taken the, the multi-track tapes um, to a party <laughs> and then left half <laughs> one side of the tape in a cab. Oh, my God. He left the finished mixes in a cab, half the album. So they had to rush to, to remix one side of the album. And he always said, you know, that album suffered because the initial mixes were just so great. Wow. And I'm still amazed that that reel of tape has never shown up. Right. In, yeah. In Sotheby's, uh, Christie's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine somebody just going, Oh, cool tape. Let me throw it away. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I've got the other side to access bold as love. What do you think I could get for it today? <laughs> Ooh, I, I have the other original the side. Original. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first final mix that right. never made it to anything. Yeah, I've had it in my well, bedroom for 25, 30, yeah, 50 right. years. Wouldn't you just love to go dig it in a box yeah. <laughs> that you forgot all about? I tell, oh, I tell, one, I tell yeah, you what. You, you, you go pull up Little Wayne. Can't, can't, sheesh. Castles made of sand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I tell you honestly, one one of my favorite things he's ever did. I don't even know if there's a title to it because it's been so long since I've had the album. And I didn't pay attention. Um, the first Woodstock album, the oh. last cut on there that's merely instrumental. Oh yeah, they, well they kind of named it Villanova Junction. Okay, but that, yeah, that's just primo. My goodness, and that's just, just that's just him just going off. It's like you know. You can leave if you want to, you know. Exactly. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I just gotta love that. Oh my God, <laughs> jamming that song. That's it, and that's. I mean, that wow. is one of my favorite Hendrix cuts of all time. It's yeah. just so, it's so impromptu, and it's just it's so great, and it's just it's him doing like West Montgomery shit, you know, all it's, day long. Wow. One of my one of my favorites is actually um, the version of Red House from the San Diego Arena that was originally on the In the West album, Hendrix in the West album. Mm. Okay. Unbelievable! <laughs> that I play. I just tell anybody if you want to understand vocabulary, sit down and listen to that, and and dig the conversation that goes on between that man and that guitar. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is that. It's. It's. You need a nap after that shit. <laughs> <laughs> you really do. Get a like, cigarette nah, and a nap. You know? <laughs> so I take it Hendrix was a huge influence. Yeah, I was just going to say this. This is turning into the. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is turning into the <laughs> other Jimmy show. You know? Exactly. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, that dude. <laughs> yeah, that dude. <laughs> the cool, but the cool thing that happened after him was the next guy, um, and it's really kind of. There's really three guys um, who make a big difference. And, and keeping me going, really four. The next one is Eddie Hazel. Um, oh, yeah. With Funkadelic. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just, wow, really? <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you get any more Hendrix inspired and then push the envelope even more so? Yeah. And Eddie really did because he kept soul at, at the cornerstone of everything, but the acid was just so overwhelming that it just... Wow, this earth meets space, for real. <laughs> <laughs> My yeah. goodness. Little, and then little, after little Eddie Hazel, 
it winds up being Eddie Martinez. Oh, wow. Um, who was in a band called Mother Night. Yeah. Um, and their first record came out in 72. Um, after him, it's Ernie Isley. <laughs> oh, Ernie um, was wonderful, man. Yeah, man. Wow. I mean, oh, my goodness. I mean, when, when, when Who's That Lady came out? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and this is the thing, and I, I love telling people, y'all don't have a clue that black radio <laughs> played the entire song. Oh, really? Guitar solo in all. Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, God loves 70s radio. Early 70s radio was like, wow, people weren't, black people weren't afraid of electric guitars anymore because <laughs> every band had to have one. Everybody uh -huh. had a fuzz box, everybody had a wah-wah pedal, everybody had a phase shifter. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there was no shortage of brothers, you know, really bringing it. But Ernie, yeah, I love this playing. I hated this tone. <laughs> but it was recognizable. Oh, dude, you could you could not, yeah, blindfold it with one ear. Van Gogh could have told you that's Ernie. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Do with one ear could tell you that was Ernie Eisen, man. <laughs> so, he had chops for days. I was yeah. just like. God, somebody give that man an, a real amp. <laughs> well, that was that was probably uh, acoustic stuff at that point, right? Probably so. Everything I've seen, yeah, from that period, they were playing. He was playing through acoustic amps. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And then the next cat after him is Ronnie Drayton. Uh huh. Um, because by the time Edwin Bird's song had dropped, um, the Supernatural album, um, it were two songs, um, Any Color and Rising Sign. And Ronnie Drayton was just absolutely bananas. So, you know, I, I, I had my hair rails pretty much. <laughs> and in between them and then after them, there were a whole bunch of other cats. I was a huge Todd Rundgren fan. Oh. Um, I was a huge Grand Funk Railroad fan. Um, nice. <laughs> I loved Cactus. Oh, yeah. I'm Cactus, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's so it's it's different because his major core influences outside of Hendrix. Uh, yeah. You would not associate with the music that he plays. D yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. 24 yeah. seven spies was, you know, that there's, was that was hardcore little, there's stuff. A, there's man. a little metal ish influence. Uh, yeah. You know, or, the, you know, the crazy thing about spies, especially in. In, in the beginning, early, early on, the band kind of got started because we didn't care for what we were hearing um, musically. The, the weird thing about the 80s was, in terms of black music, everything had become electronic. Everything was electronic-based. It was bad drum machines, bad mm -hmm. keyboards, oh, bad yeah. low quarters. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, this is garbage. On the other side of that, after the punk thing happened, you had New Wave. And... New Wave started off really, really good, and then it became a cliche. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it went to trash really quick. <laughs> really quickly. So it was kind of like, wow, what, what could have been good, we found a whole, you know, spawned a whole generation of, of bad imitators. <laughs> so, you know, we're just kind of listening to what's going on, and there's really not much to speak of. And we kind of said, well, why don't we form a band and play the kind of music we want to play? so we can hear what we want to hear. Wow. Now, I got to I got to ask you because the rap scene started in the 80s and it started to gain popularity and the R&B side well, mm -hmm. you know, Motown was gone. Mm -hmm. and, oh, long gone. <laughs> and, and the R&B singers, they weren't R&B. They were it was like you said, it was bad electronic music. Yeah. Uh, you how did you find other guys that were on that same level? as you were because i mean i know i i went to school with a guy named charlie gorman okay <laughs> and he's been with thrash bands beyond belief he's 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 oh, black right he's a black bass player mm -hmm. and uh he's the only guy i've ever met that was like you know into that really mm. that, like more crazier scene than i ever was <laughs> and and still to this day he still plays and but he's predominantly white bands I okay. mean, he, you know, and but to find three other guys in your neighborhood that have that same drive, that's pretty unique, man. You know, the coolest thing about growing up, I grew up in the South Bronx. And when you say the South Bronx t to anybody, nine out of ten times, they go, oh, oh, that's the home of rap. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Granted. Yeah. That's that's cool and all that. And there's this. I said, but there was a whole other culture that existed before rap was born. Everybody, there was a band in almost every project. Um, huh. wow. And that was the thing. You know, I, I grew up, I grew even in my building. I had, I had guys who had inspired me because one of the greatest bass players I ever knew was a cat named A.J. Cresswell. Um, literally was a prodigy. Um, and his band was just amazing. band called The Seventh Galaxy. And the coolest thing about all of the older guys was that they allowed me to come in to their rehearsals. You know, this this little kid, I'm seven, eight, nine years old. You know, most people be like, ah, oh, go away, kid, you're bothering me, you know, shoe or whatever. And instead, they would be like, because I was so serious about trying to learn, they would let me come in. That's and, very cool. And, and, and soak up as much as I could. But there were bands all in our neighborhoods. So, wow. So you had you it all know, around you. That That's an awesome thing, man. It is. Yeah, I, I wish, you know, I, I miss that. There was also a really big sense of community. So yeah. it was kind of like there was competition, but there was community in the same sense. Because it was kind of like you, you wanted to be the best band in your neighborhood, mm-hmm. even though you knew that there was a better band just three blocks <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. So you aspired to, to, to be better than them, so you can kick their ass the next time you guys played against each other. <laughs> that's right. But you were still, see, that's the thing is that, it, and that's where we had this conversation before, it kind of took a mm-hmm. turn because there was still a camaraderie there. Even yeah, though you were oh, kind of yeah. competing with each right. other, you weren't leaving each other out to, to, to no, sink. It, it wasn't cut Oh, right. no, not at all. Yeah. No, not at all. And, you, because, and you know, you the, the older guys were trying to influence the younger guys. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it, you know, I, I I wish more than anything else. I wish there were VCRs and camcorders <laughs> and all of that because there's so much stuff. I you know I I can sit for days and just talk about what it was like. It would be wonderful if people could see what it was like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they don't they don't even they don't have a clue. They don't get it. It's yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like you had to have been there. I got lucky with spies because it really kind of starts with the original singer, I'd known him because he was in a band. And the band that I had at that point, my horn section, they left my band and joined his band. <laughs> oh, great. No, no biggie. But this one day, you know, we, and we were all still friends because we all grew up together. And they were just like, why don't you come up to our rehearsal? And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to go to your rehearsal. And they were like, please come up to the rehearsal because, you know, the guitar player's a real asshole. And mm. we just want you to come up and just really shut him up. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, you leave you leave our band to go join their band, but now you want me to come up to your rehearsal to shut him up because he's an asshole. <laughs> We, we we actually really just want you in the band. No, no, they really wanted me to come up. Oh, with, really? Yeah, because he thought he was the shit. So they were uh-huh. like, he has no clue that you can play rings around everybody. Just wow. come up and you know, just hang out. Like we we just we we just came from hanging out. We had to get to rehearsal, so he came with us. Oh, hey, he you, goes, <laughs> you see what they were doing? They were making him like Jack Butler from uh, Crossroads. <laughs> <laughs> he got to go in there and cut his head and then. <laughs> <laughs> so as I watch him trying to butcher a song that he's trying to learn, they're like, you know, he plays. Why don't you let him play? Oh, you play? I was like, yeah, I play a little something. <laughs> oh, well, well, go ahead. Here, take my guitar. No problem. Oh, One, man. two, three, hit it. Boom. I fall right in, and it's just like, oh, shit. So I never liked him, and and we didn't see each other for maybe about another six years, but we bumped into each other on the street one day after not seeing each other for six years, and it was like, wow, every you know, we're not the same dudes that we were, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was kind of like, wow, so what are you, are you still playing? I'm like, sure, I'm still playing. What are you up to? Oh, man, we, we need to talk. We should talk about some things, and we had a conversation, and we had both decided that, we loved a lot of the same bands growing up and we wished that we could kind of keep that tradition going. And he had a drummer and we had a, he had a bass player too, but the bass player freaked out the first time we went down to the village. Um, he'd never been outside of his neighborhood in Harlem and we went down to Astor Place and he literally had a panic attack. Wow. <laughs> and he freaked out. He was like, 
there's some devil shit going on down here. <laughs> uh, no, dude, it's called the village. What? Look at all these weird motherfuckers with spikes here, and the spikes here, and weird colors. And I, I don't like this. What? <laughs> I can't play with you guys. And he laughed. He literally laughed. Oh, <laughs> my God. I was like, wow. Literally, I literally didn't get out much. <laughs> he, damn, sh- he never left his block. I was like, a sheltered mother... Hey, yeah, dude never got off his block. So wow. I said, yo, I know a bass player who would be perfect. Now, Rick Skater, wow, my right-hand man, favorite bass player on the planet. We grew up... Literally, I grew up on 138th Street. He grew up on like 137th, three blocks, four blocks down. So for a whole good year, everybody would ask me, do I know this guy named Cameo? Who the fuck is Cameo? <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing, amazing bass player. I'm like, no, I don't know him. And everybody was asking him, do you know the captain? Who the fuck is the captain? <laughs> <laughs> But I used to wear a captain's hat. I had jerry curls at this point, but I used to rock a captain's hat. <laughs> so dudes are asking him, do you know the captain? He's like, the captain? The Gordon Fisherman? Who the fuck is the captain? <laughs> and it turns out to be me, and he turns out to be Cameo because he had a flat top haircut, and he looked like Larry Blackman from Cameo. Oh, that's oh funny as hell. <laughs> so when we, when, we finally, <laughs> when we finally saw each other, it was like, Oh, uh, you must be... Cameo? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is that you, Captain? Is that you, Cameo? Oh, my and, God. <laughs> and that was like, wow. I love it first sight, and then we played, and it was kind of like, really? Wow. <laughs> and you've been three I, blocks I away. I know that you lived down there. Right, right. Yeah, man. And, That's great. And the team formed from there, so by the time I bring him into the band, it was perfect, and, you know... Um, we started doing our thing. And then the crazy thing happened was our, our, our original drummer, who really had kind of like one foot in the street life and another in the music, um, winds up quitting the band and not long after that got shot. Damn, man. So we replaced him with, with a really great drummer. And next thing we knew, about a year later, or maybe even six months later, we had a deal. Wow. It's so cool. Yeah, that's 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 when you know record companies actually gave bands deals, you know, and, yeah. and developed yeah. them. And, you yeah, know. exactly. Yeah, so I mean, it was like we had built up an audience really quickly, which, when I think about it, is almost kind of like amazing. But it also makes me sad because the scene that existed at that point was just thriving. I mean, there yeah. were so many great rooms to play in. There were so many bands. It, all of a sudden, there was this excitement about music again yeah um and and great rooms to play in and i mean literally we you could play almost every week you know even though some places didn't want you to come in because they knew you just played last week right. and you drew a really nice crowd but yeah they, they didn't want to wear you out in their venue yeah but, you know no they wanted yeah. to make sure they could still get that beer money you know oh, yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, you know what? You can't overexpose it if it comes in every week and, you know, the crowd goes, oh, I can just see them next week. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. You know, but we, we played our asses off, and that was that was a thing. And really, in no time flat, we kind of pulled in this really rabid, crazy audience. <laughs> Well, you're a yeah. rabid, crazy band, well, man. Was, was, you know? man. I tell you what, it looked like a lot of people on stage that would make their way to the stage, and uh, a lot of mosh pits and people flying off the stage. And <laughs> the crazy, you know, the funny thing is, in the beginning, like the music we played in the beginning was maybe one half of what the record became. Our early shows, the music was just really wow. It it was um. Somebody called it, we used to call it surf punk music. Wow. Really? It, it, yeah, it was. It, if you ever hear the early, early, early stuff, it wasn't so much hardcore based. It was just, it was really, really crazy beach punk surf music huh. with funk <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of that. So it's like, no, I, I understand why we didn't sound like anybody else to a lot of people. Um, and it, yeah. it made sense. We didn't have great songs, but we had great spirit. We also had great musical chops. Yeah. Which was a crazy thing. So 
we weren't writing songs to like you're gonna hear this on your radio. We we were writing shit that nobody would ever hear unless you came to a show. Yeah, well, I, I, the other thing is too is that if you know um, some of their stuff, it was it was kind of before the time. You know, yeah. they were heavy. When they would go low, they were low. They were they were lower than like you know the bands that were out there like Anthrax and Metallica mm-hmm. and bands. Those guys were still playing in just E, or they were dropping it down a half step. You know, but these guys had some serious low end did to you, them. Did you go? You know, did you seriously drop down to you know? Did you do C's some open some, open I'll tunings? You, you know what happened when I was a kid, and it's so funny because I I actually just posted this yesterday. But when I when I was a kid, um, I used to hold the spindle on the turntable to slow down um, whatever was playing mm-hmm. because I would see colors. Oh, um, yeah, I do remember you posting this. Yeah, probably from about the age of four, and I didn't I didn't understand why I saw colors, but I just noticed that when I when I would down pitch stuff. Um, the progressions, the, the, the chords all of a sudden took on a different meaning, huh. and they, they felt more emotional to me. And, of course, when you start playing guitar, you know, I grabbed, I got a pitch pipe. So I'm, I'm playing in standard E. I'm all right, cool, 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 cool. You know, it's just hurting my fingers, and it sucks. <laughs> um, but then when I would listen to some of the records that I really dug, I was like, he's not tuned in E. <laughs> mm, <huh. laughs> you know? So I'd start tuning down, and I it it was real gradual in the beginning. I started I kept playing. I played an E flat for the longest, and then once I got really really good, I was good by the time I was about eleven. I could play like wow. my friends. Some of my older friends would try to sneak me in to the bars and claim I was a midget, <laughs> <laughs> just so I can like smoke the old dudes at the band band and shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing I hated was that every time you went to a jam session, everybody wanted to jam in E. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know something? I learned to hate the key of E just because, you know, every bass player wanted to be Larry Graham, so he wanted to slap and pluck. Right. Hey, man, let's jam in E. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I kept going further and further and further. But by the time we cut the first album, we cut the first album in the key of E. Um, when we got to the second album, I started to drop, and I cut all the songs that I'd written. I cut them in D, okay. and for some strange reason, nobody was tuning down. No. Um, and this was still nineteen. This was nineteen ninety, but nobody. Not at that time, was, man. No, nobody had really done that yet. It wasn't until about the mid nineties before corn yeah. before corn came out. Yeah. You know, once corn came out, and everybody was like, "Oh, just, let's tune down the A." It just seems like I got it's... a corn story for you. Okay, here's <laughs> yeah. a great. This is funny. We had played in um, <laughs> wow, good lord, Bakersfield. That's where they were from, Bakersfield. Um, and we we spent literally when the first record came out, we went on tour. And the greatest thing, the funniest thing that happened was that we got lucky about say maybe a, about six months before we got a deal. Um, Fishbone had come to town, and we were huge Fishbone fans. So um, a good friend of ours who worked at probably one of the, one of the greatest clubs that no longer exists, the Ritz, mm. said, yo, want to open? We were like, hell yeah. <laughs> so we get on the bill. So we opened for Fishbone, um, I think the first time, and we opened for him a second time. Now, the cool thing was we used to look on the back of album covers of bands that we liked to see who was representing them. Because um, we were like, how do we find a manager? <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. So we wow. looked on the back of the Fishbone album and the Smart. Bus Boys album and the Chili Peppers and the Bad Brains album. <laughs> so it turns out um, it was a guy named Roger Perry who was managing the Bus Boys and he also managed Fishbone. So we had sent him a tape. <clears throat> We also sent a tape to Lindy Getz, who was managing the Chili Peppers. Um, he actually wrote back and said, I don't understand what you guys are trying to do. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. <laughs> which, which I thought was really funny because I was like... <laughs> um, it's called we, music? <laughs> <laughs> you manage the Chili Peppers, uh, and you don't understand what we're doing? <laughs> All right, no problem. Roger Perry writes back. He's like, this is some really interesting stuff. 
um, you know, keep me keep me posted, you know, maybe we can talk or something at some point. He was based in California, but this one particular time, luckily for us, um, we opened for Fishbone, and their booking agent is there. And he comes to us after the show, and he goes, wow, hmm. you guys are amazing. I'm like, oh, you know, we don't even know who he is. We're like, well, thanks, dude. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, so how'd you, you know, like, who put you on for the show? Like, who's your manager? And we're like, we don't have a manager. <laughs> he goes, well, who, who's your booking agent? Who, who put you on the bill? We go, we don't have a booking agent. He goes, you're kidding. You don't have a manager, you don't have a booking agent. He goes, um, how much did you get paid for the show? And we were like, paid? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, nothing. We did the gig because we wanted to play with Fishbone. He goes, so wait a minute, let me get this straight. You have no manager. <laughs> <laughs> no you agent. You have no booking agent, and you got paid nothing for this show. <laughs> we were like, yeah, but we wanted to play. Yeah. And he goes, okay, I'll make you a deal. He goes, I'll get you two more shows with Fishbone at $500 a show. And we were like, what? <laughs> we he goes, on one condition. And we were like, what? He goes, you get a record deal? I'm your booking agent. And he pulled out his card and turned it was Jonathan Levi from William Morris Agency. <laughs> and we wow. were like, oh, shit. Okay, that's Fishbone's <laughs> booking agent. So we were like, oh, my God. So, and then it turns out Roger Perry, Fishbone's you know, manager, it all kind of fell in, so we wound up with the same organization that handled them. Um, but it was so funny. So we, you know, we tore our asses off. We, there wasn't any place that we didn't play. The funny thing is there's always a list that goes around between the agencies, mm -hmm. um, especially with up-and-coming bands, because they always want to see who they can either partner somebody up with or if they want to get somebody on a support tour. We had such a reputation before we even got out of New York that when the list went out, nobody wanted to take us out. Hmm. <laughs> Great. N nobody <laughs> wanted to take this band out. Now, we'd open for Pill. We'd open for the Ramones. Everybody we opened up for, we basically just destroyed. We didn't, you know, it was like our, our, our motto was we can be great friends and we have the ultimate respect for everybody. But when it's time for us to do our job, we don't give a fuck about you. Yeah, we come, nice. we come to do our job. When the show's over, we can kiss, shake hands, share a beer, whatever. <laughs> but That's when cool. it's showtime, we cutting heads. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, what a what a what a dichotomy, or or, or a, a, what is the word I'm looking for? Of you know, it's 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 a fantastically weird place to be in because you you are. You are so good. Yeah. Yeah, and it, but you scare everybody. It, and, exactly. You're 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 sure. so good. You're too good, and you're young enough that you need to go out as as, as an opener, but you're mm -hmm. good enough to go out as a headliner. Yeah. You and know? the best thing that happened was that we had William, we had the power of William Morris. So I, Jonathan Levine says, "Look, um, nobody wants to take you guys out." Yeah. <laughs> You know, and he, he's sitting there with this really... That's like, he, thank you, I think. You know? <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't look pissed. He actually had this... You could see the horns just coming out of his head. He goes, this is amazing. He goes, um, we submitted you guys for everything that genre-related or anything not genre-related that you could fit into, and nobody wants to take you guys out. Wow. And we were like, so what does that mean for us? He goes... Um, I think it might mean that we go ahead and you guys go out and you go out and you do your own headline tour. Hmm. Introduce yourselves to America the old-fashioned way. And we were like, why the hell not? Yeah. You know, the record company was like, cool in the gang, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll tour support it. And that's what we did. So the I mean, good thing was we got into all the right rooms all across America some of the rooms had people in them. Um, some of them had half-filled houses. Um, but the whole point was everywhere we went, we played like... We didn't play for people. We played for ourselves. Right. Mm. So it didn't matter, you know, if, if the biggest room we played in held 500 people, 
and it was 150 to 200 people, we played like it was 500 people. Sure. I, I mean, you're musicians first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and, and you're playing what you want to play the way you want to play it. That's, that's the most important thing, and that's going to come off the stage, you know, and people are going to notice when the, the musicianship <laughs> is on that stage you know they're they're not just looking at people just jumping around trying to impress them they're looking no. at real musicians playing real music you know for real musicians which you know are the people that, are, whole, that are yeah it really kind of lays the foundation and the funniest thing for me was speaking of that jumping around thing see in this band initially it was crazy on stage um rick could walk on a wall he could run up a wall i've seen him run up a wall and flip and not miss a note, not miss a lick on bass, hmm. which I, I'm still amazed at the shit I've watched him do over the last 25 years. <laughs> um, me, on the other hand, you know, because I was like, wow, I got to go crazy like everybody else. And <laughs> so this one night, this is on the tour. Um, every night I try to get a board tape. I always wanted to, you know, record the shows. Mm -hmm. And this one that I'm like, I, I got to get buck wild like everybody else, man. So I'm, I'm flopping all over the place, jumping <laughs> off shit. Ooh, I'm going ape shit. I'm having a ball. I'm like, yeah, I'm rocking out like everybody else, man. When I heard that tape, I sound like I was two years old. <laughs> I, play, I sounded like I had no clue of how to play guitar. <laughs> And that's it all hell's no. Yeah, right. That, that's right. a hard thing to do, man, especially you're if you're only a guitar player. Right. Yeah. yeah. You start it's jumping around, things start to go south quick. Then you decide which is more important, you yeah. know. I, I decided at that point, you know, it's it's much better to be the rock. Right. And, yeah. and, and hold it down. You know, I move if the music felt, if I felt the need to move, I would move. I mean, I didn't stand stock still, but I couldn't do what those cats were doing. Yeah. <laughs> that tape was like oh god I suck. <laughs> <laughs> you know did, did so the you... cool thing is when we spent all of 89 there wasn't any place that we didn't play and because of that tour in particular that's what cemented the audience that has stayed with us for 25 years wow um you know I, i'm amazed sometimes because every year we did the same thing you know we put out a record and we go out and supported it mm -hmm. um 89 was a, a really amazing year, so much to the point that when we dropped the second record, um, we thanked all of the bands who opened up for us <laughs> yeah. on that record. And to this day, everybody goes, so Alice in Chains opened up for you guys. <laughs> We're like, yeah, as a matter of fact, the show that they opened up for us really kind of cemented their deal with Sony. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> we, played, um, we played at this place called, um, God, what was it called? Oh, I can't say the name, but I know it was in Tacoma. Um, and the one thing I always love to do was check out the opening bands because it, it's just, it would be no different than us being in New York opening for somebody bigger than us. Mm -hmm. um, everybody wants to see what the opening act is going to be like, you know, because if, if you got on the bill, you must have something. Right. Yeah, that, yeah. That, you know, so it was no different from us. And since we were the new kids out. The crazy thing that we didn't understand was that our record was everywhere that we weren't before we got there. So there were all these bands already already hip to this band and already knowing these songs and already loving this band. So every time there was a band that opened up for us, they were already in awe of us, and we really didn't get that. We were just yeah. surprised. Hmm. So by the time we hit Tacoma, um, Alice in Chains is on the, actually the hottest band wow the two hottest bands at that point out of seattle because well mother love bone andy wood had already passed mm -hmm. um it was a band called hungry crocodiles which was like almost like a chili peppers knockoff but for some strange reason they had a huge following but they had no deal and allison chains who was like the, the real up-and-comer mm -hmm. nirvana was already kind of doing their thing but they were horrible at that point. And that was probably before Mother Love Bone turned it to Pearl Jam. Yeah. It was before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm like, all right, cool, well, who's on the bill? Yada, yada, yada. I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't know these bands, but I'm, you know, I'm like, whatever. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I kid you not, when Alice Chain, when they came in, 
And, you know, everybody's talking. They're just like, wow, this is great. It was amazing. Honor to honor to open, yada, yada, yada. When they hit sound check and they played We Die Young, I literally, I think my jaw hit the floor. Wow. <laughs> because it was just like, these motherfuckers don't sound like what we've been hearing <laughs> on yeah. this tour. Yeah, they yeah. came, they were so on point. They were so original. It was it was deep. It was really, 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 really deep. Uh, can, can you I imagine mean, having people like that open up for you? I mean... Nirvana opened up for us at the outhouse in Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best I ever had is we opened up for uh, Stone Temple Pilots. Oh, nice. Yeah. Excellent. And they, and they came out and they blew the PA system up. <laughs> Literally, the the, to, the, uh, the horn drivers went out in one wow. side of the stack. And it was pretty crazy. They were, uh, they were really good. Yeah. I mean, you know, but we, we didn't even know who they were. Wow. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that was yeah. the thing. You know, for every, and that was the thing that we discovered as we went from state to state to state to state. You would yeah. always find out who the hottest band was because if you were the if you were the hot national act the promoter would always try to get the hottest local mm -hmm. regional sure, act to yeah. support the bill to you know to, to fill out the house so there were tons of bands who opened up for us who went on to become what they became talking speaking about corn in 89 yeah, was there was no you. corn they were called LAPD um, wow. Well. <laughs> LAPD. And actually, at that point, it was just, it was Brian um, with a totally different band. And we played Bakersfield, and they opened up for us, and we destroyed that. We destroyed every place we played. That was our motto, to, to mm -hmm. destroy anything in our wake, leave <laughs> everything smoking, nothing standing, That's get right. on bus, get the fuck out of town. <laughs> But this was great. So they opened up for us. I'm just like, yeah, pff, whatever. Another another bad wannabe white boy, Chili Pepper Funk knockoff, whatever. Thought no more about it. <laughs> Move forward about that was that was I think eighty nine or ninety. Move forward to like ninety four, I think it was ninety four, <clears throat> and I, I'm living in L A. And a friend of mine calls up and goes, Yo, um, there's a band that's going to be showcasing out at the Whiskey tonight. Um, everybody's saying you really should come and see this band. I'm like, really? I'm like, oh, okay. And I didn't. I really didn't care to go out when I lived in L.A. I tried to stay in as much as I could. But I said, oh, I'll go check them out. So my bass player and I, we go down, and there's only about 50 people in the club. Wow. Mm. I'm like, okay, it's corn. <laughs> and I'm... I'm we're standing there watching the band, and we're going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and I tell you, I gave a dog a pound. I'm like, okay, you know, but, but the band was killing. Mm -hmm. It was just really weird. It was just kind of like, this is some other shit. I'm not, it sounds like us on, on dust or something. <laughs> yeah. And bagpipes. What the fuck is this? <laughs> but, then, but then I look, and I'm like, oh, my God. I recognize Brian. Now that's his name. His name is Monkey, right? No, he's Head. Oh, I'm sorry. Head. Yes, yes, I, I get him mixed so, up. You know, and you know, the, the one thing which I'm I'm proud of is that I don't forget faces, and I don't forget names. Um, you know, everybody else can say, "Oh man, you know, I smoke and drink so much that I remember nothing." <laughs> no, I, I I remember everything. So I, I told Rick, "Yo, I know that dude." He goes, "Which dude?" I'm like, "That guitar player." He's like, "Who is he?" I'm like, that's Brian. Um, he was in a band called LAPD. They opened up for us in, in Bakersfield, like in 89 or 90. He goes, I don't remember. Rick remembers nothing or nobody. <laughs> so show's over. We go outside, and then, you know, they're loading up into the van and whatnot. And I go, Brian. And he turns around, and he literally almost faints. He goes, oh, my God, what are you doing here? I said, I live here. I said, what happened to you? And he goes, man, you know, he goes, after, after y'all came through and we did that hit at Bakersfield, he goes, I really wanted to get serious about this band, but the band didn't want to get serious. And he's like, I wanted to get into something so much more heavier. He goes, so, you know, wow. half the band kind of went their own way and we found new guys and this is what we turned into. I was like, wow. 
Interesting. Interesting. That Same thing with Limp cool. Biscuit. You know, we played Jacksonville, and wow, they were too young to get into the club. Really? <laughs> yeah. But I still have the original demo tape that they um, came out through Ichiban. Still have it. Um, huge Boss fans. Wow. Really? Okay, cool. I'm like <laughs> 15. The drum was 15, I think, at the time. Mm. Same thing, you know. And that they happened. Same thing with P.O.D. So many. It was so many bands. Um, yeah. We watched a lot happen that we were just amazed that it happened. But in the same sense, we were amazed that we got left out as everybody got hit to what we were doing three years prior. And all of a sudden, we weren't invited to the, to the party. <laughs> oh, man. You know, that's uh, there it, it was there was such a. That was actually a, another really good time in music, you know. Where yeah. There was a lot going on, and there were there was there were places to play, yes. you know. And, oh man! Now, you know, which which sorely lacks nowadays, you know. And mm -hmm. that's that's why things are yeah. so different. There's just not all these bands playing all these rooms all the time, you know. And, yeah. And, and getting good, and you know, exactly. playing place music. To cut your teeth, right? Yeah. And playing I mean, different kind of music, and you know, and now, it now, doesn't exist so much anymore the one question sure. i have is and 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 maybe you'll agree with me on this jimmy mm -hmm. is uh you know that first corn album yeah um i don't i don't think it was recorded very well it was as dry as could be oh yeah the guitars sounded kind of i mean they were they were okay but it was nothing like like their later albums. I oh, mean, no, you, you could, oh, you could tell it was very low budget. Well, I was going to say, there's probably no money behind it. Yeah, it was album. no oh, money behind know. it. But I tell you what, that thing, I don't know what it was about that album. Mm -hmm. but it, that, had, it had its own vibe. And that really, thing really did. took yeah. off like a rocket. Yeah. It sure did. I mean, it put them into <clears throat> another realm of... And it, they overnight made the seven-string guitar cool. Mm-hmm. You know the funny. Yeah, I always say that it's really funny because for as much as people now like to go, oh God, Limp Biscuit, oh God, it's a corn up. It's a. I'm like, <laughs> y'all don't understand how those bands shot up and dominated and created an even bigger scene that was the sub. You know, it was a subgenre to an extent. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I said in '89 in an interview for MTV. Um, that we were the alternative to the mainstream. I said, but what you're going to see in the next couple of years is what is alternative will become the mainstream. And the guy that interviewed us was sitting there looking at me like I was crazy. And I said, you don't understand what I mean. And he goes, well, what's happening now it will probably be happening for the next 10 years. I said, oh, no, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, these are disposable times, my friend. I said, yeah. it'll only get worse. But yeah. what's happening right now is that everybody who's not hip will become hip really quick. And everything that is, quote unquote, under the radar will finally come above. And everybody's going to go, I was there. I knew. <laughs> sure, yeah. I saw you that know, when I, they were nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I said, trust me, it, 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 it happens. I, I, I refer to it as the cycle of shit. It's almost like I call it the 10-year cycle of shit. <laughs> Everything starts off unbelievably wonderful. And by the midway point... It all turns to crap. You got a whole bunch, you got a whole host of imitators, and you got people with money. Because mm -hmm. this is what happened with us in particular. We cut a crazy-ass path that nobody saw coming. Um, we sold more records than anybody even, than we even anticipated with the first two records on our little tiny label, but it worked. Influenced everybody under the sun. Moved to a major label, dropped two records, and the major label tried to kill us, but that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. But made two records that really shifted everything and because the powers that be did not want to see what was coming or did not want to see this thing be dominated um, by people of color, which was really weird. 87, 88, 89, 90, 91. The beautiful thing about those years in particular was that 
it was the most colorblind period in hmm. rock music. Yeah. Because once you got I past never, the hairband, I never band, thought about that really. Yeah, the hairband thing. Once, once was, you, yeah. yeah, once you got past the hairband stage, all of us were we we were like brothers. It was it was a thing about we're, we're all in this common. We got this common goal. Yeah, because um, I mean, su- suicidal. All man, there was so many. Yeah, I, I, I really face yeah. no more. Yeah. suicidal tendencies, exodus, anthrax, living color, spies, bad brains, fishbone, chili peppers. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, man, it, you're, it, <laughs> it you're, was. Just, and we were, and this is how this is how the crossover happened, which you know the record companies didn't see coming, which was even funny because I watched record companies sink money into a band because they fit. It's the Johnny Bravo thing. You fit the suit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that doesn't wow. guarantee that people will gravitate towards this band because you put money into it. Because this, at this point in particular, the bands were so real that the record companies were smart to not put money into promoting these bands because it would have made us look like we were all trying to sell out. Yeah, and and if you think about the grunge, you know the grunge oh, dude, piece of you it. Know, gr- grunge. You know what the thing about grunge is? Here's my <laughs> logic, <laughs> and everybody's got an opinion about grunge. Here's here's my thing. I watched Fishbone, who could have easily been the biggest band in the world, with the biggest cult following of every nationality on the planet. Yeah, yeah, those guys. I watched Bad Brains, Mm -hmm. Mm. four black dudes, rosters, with the biggest cult following of every nationality on the planet. I watched the Chili Peppers, and this is when Hello was still in the band, still alive. Mm. Mm. Four white dudes with the biggest crossover cultural fan base, every nationality. Oh yeah, they were huge before they were huge. We played with them. Wow. Well, funny thing is, I, I saw them twice when it was still Hillel and Jack Irons. Mm. Um, we played with them right when they got John and Chad, and they actually played a couple of dates to kind of break the guys in, and we played together, wow, at a, at a spot called Streets out on Long Island. Um, but it was so deep because the audiences were just as mixed up as the bands were. Mm-hmm. Mm. And the craziest thing I saw happen by the time we got to a major label was that major labels didn't do what independent labels did. Independent labels didn't create boxes. What they created was music. Yeah. And they put the music out and they let the music do the talking. Right. Yeah. Right. What and the major labels did was they tried to make compartments for you to fit into. They just micro-categorized yeah. everything. Well, and, and if you really think about it, all the hair bands that came up through the 80s and all, mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. just got, it, it just became so corporate America. And oh, just, it really did. Yeah, that, that that time that he's talking about, the, the, the end of the 80s, the 90s, mm-hmm. that it was cool to have that band that was underground. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, even though it was underground, they, they could fill... If they could find a place, they could do twenty thousand yeah. seats. They could still, yeah, they and they would pack it. Great business, yeah, right? right, right. But what happened by the time we got to a major ninety one, ninety two, the crazy thing that I saw happen was the majors had basically gotten all of the bands who had been signed to indie labels and had great success, and I'm talking about the bands who weren't white. All of a sudden, the black bands became involved, like, okay, now they've proven their worth. We should go after them, Hmm. and let's get them to come over here. And you get them, but you don't have a division or a department in your major label for a black band who plays rock. Hmm. You don't Hmm. know what to do with us. You don't know what to do with us because the box you've created for every white band they fit the suit. They can automatically fall into that slot, and you can manipulate anything, any way, any way you want. But you don't know how to do that with us because you're not thinking of us as people. You're thinking <laughs> of us as a color, and that's the worst thing you could have did oh, to the sure. scene. Oh, sure. Yeah, man. So I, I remember I sat in a meeting. I won't name names, 
but I was privy to sitting into a meeting with some really heavy fuckers. And the only reason why I was invited was because two of them were my friends. And I sat in this meeting, and I was supposed to be quiet. <laughs> I really was. I was supposed to be quiet. But I, I couldn't be quiet because I was kind of like, how are you going to talk about black bands when I'm the only black guy in the room? And you motherfuckers don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and you want me to be quiet. <laughs> and you want me to, yeah. yeah. I am not the spook who sat by the door. That is not, are you motherfucking crazy? You know, and I got into this big argument. And I said, you don't see what just happened. You know, by the time Woodstock happened, I said, do you know what that core audience was? I said, that is the alternative turning into the mainstream. Mm, Why yeah. do you think, I said, look at all the bands that just played. They cross every barrier you can possibly imagine. And the people knew who they were coming to see. You don't yeah, get yeah. it. You're yeah. missing the point. But what I did find out was Nirvana was really, and, and I always say this, is this just really annoys me. When somebody says, we really kind of have to take back rock. <laughs> we have to take back rock. And... I hated to say this, but Nirvana became that band. They fit the bill. Hmm. Now, granted, Nevermind is a great record. Yeah. Great record. Great record for what it's worth. I, 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 I guess mm -hmm. it is. I guess it is. It, it falls under the, the genre of rock, I guess, in, in only in the way that it was what rock happened to be at that time what they considered it to be yeah right. and, and that yeah. and that almost wasn't the case and i tell you the funny thing was I, most of my friends from seattle took great offense to the term grunge because they were like what the fuck is grunge mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like something on the it's bottom just, of a boat you know yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> does it come from puget sound right <laughs> <laughs> they did, they were like we're not grunge and they you know once again there's that thing somebody comes up with a catchy catchphrase yeah we talk about run that. Yeah. With it. yeah it's, it's those just, labels. just another category yeah you know? those and labels kill me th man. that could be a whole nother conversation and you know i and i i love i love the stories i love all these stories here <laughs> all right well that's that's the end of part one of a, of a two-part series with uh, Mr. Jimmy Hazel, and yeah. Uh, yeah, what a, what a cool guy, huh? He's uh, he's uh, he's he's definitely uh, you can tell music is his life. I know, and well, I mean, you know, when when your when your <laughs> life starts with meeting Hendrix, yeah, I guess from there you, on it's like, well, okay, you know, I th <laughs> I think you go, I better do something with this. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, he he mentioned a, you know, a couple of his his influences. You know, he mentioned like uh, Ronnie Drayton and and Eddie Martinez. Yeah, you know, and they're um, I I was fortunate enough uh, last year, at the end of last year, sometime. Um, Jimmy invited me to this uh, this event he puts on called the uh, Million Man Mosh, uh -huh. and um, he invited uh, he invited us up to New York to to come hang out and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got to meet a lot of the a lot of the people there, and uh, Ronnie and Eddie were both there. Awesome! And I got to meet them. Uh, there were, I mean, this this whole thing was it was just a night full of just fantastic musicians, just all so jamming cool, man. together on stage. Uh, there, there was, you know, there was, I mean, real honest to God, old school rap and metal happening on that stage and it was just it was so cool you know that's but, awesome uh, you know he he mentioned those those guys as influences and they're still friends of his and i actually got to meet them i mean you know eddie martinez played with uh with bowie oh well you there know? you go man he's uh he, he's a hell of a player too there there i mean the the talent was just ridiculous so that's too cool he's had some great influences and hopefully he influences some people himself because he's a, he's a really great player uh, well, hopefully we great and original. It'll so, happen you know. through this show. I hope. Well, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. So, um, so until there you have it. until next time, my friend. I am Mick Marcelino. There we go. And you are Jeff. damn. That leaves me to be over. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> and I, <laughs> and what do you say? Uh, uh, you say it. Well, God say it for me. Onward.
Be sure to follow the show on Twitter at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and Lick of the Week with Dave Nassie, visit our website, AmpsAndAxisCast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.